If you have your Bible with me today, if you want to turn to Colossians, we are still in our Colossians series. Uh, Jesse preached an awesome message last week. I encourage you, if you missed out on that message, to listen to it about how we're supposed to grow in Christ and mature in Christ, especially in America where there's really nothing hindering us. There's no persecution hindering us, so why not take this time now to grow? There's no opposition. Let's grow. Let's mature in Christ. Uh, But today we get to see one of the reasons why Paul wrote this letter to the church of Colossians. There's a few reasons, but this is one of the main ones. Uh, So let's read, starting in Colossians 2, uh, verse 8. It says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. and You have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, who were once dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. There's a lot of things to unpack in these verses. I actually have, we, I have a lot more to read today, but I'm stopping there for a moment. Uh, there are some things in here that we normally don't hear preached about, right? Things like elemental spirits, philosophy, circumcision. And then the verses ahead that I haven't read yet, there's festivals and new moon celebrations and worship of angels. We have to understand why Paul is writing this to this group of people. Uh, the church in Colossians was a new church. Uh, and Epaphras came to Paul. We all learned that Epaphras is the guy who started the church. Uh, we've mentioned that every week now, so if you don't know that, get it in your head, Epaphras. And so Paul, he came to Paul and said, there's an issue right now. My church is collected of Jewish and Gentile people, and there's a group of people in the church that are starting to say there's, with new teachings, convincing our church that even though Jesus did it all, there's still more to the gospel. There's still more you need to do. You have to follow all these Jewish laws and philosophies of that day to be a Christian. I love this because anyone like a good spy movie? Yeah. I like the ones where there's a huge twist at the end where like the good guy you think is good ends up being bad, like he's an undercover agent working the whole time. That's what we're encountering in the church today. So many times we think like the, the things steering us away from Christ are going to be some outside sinful sources, right? But actually what's steering people away from Christ is the inside religion of this church. They're trying to convince people there's more to the gospel. And so Paul writes this letter, writes this part of the letter to warn them that they're wrong. And we don't see this in the English version well, but anyone like a good pun? I'm a dad, so I don't really tell my daughter dad jokes, but I laugh at a lot of dad jokes. Anyone like dad jokes? I saw, <laughs> I got a few today, just because I figured I lightened the mood that I, I looked up. And I, lo- I don't know why I love this one so much. To the man who invented zero, thanks for nothing. Right? <laughs> I don't know why that's so funny. Two windmills are hanging out. One asks the other, what's your favorite music? And the other says, I'm a big metal fan. (laughs) Right? And so, (laughs) I saw that one, and I just laughed for a good two hours in the office. Just by myself. Jesse wasn't here. I was just laughing. I'm a big metal fan. And Paul, we don't see it. Paul is actually making a play on words and a pun in this first verse. Um, If we look uh, at at the phrase, to take captive. This is the only time he uses this Greek word. This is the only time this, this Greek word is ever used, and he's making a point. So, Kendra, I have that on a slide so we can see it. When he says, don't take captive, that's the word. I can't pronounce it. Jesse was here. And then the word that's closest to it is synagogue. And most New Testament scholars believe Paul was making a point, don't go back to the Jewish system. That's what he's trying to say. Don't let that take captive. Don't be synagogued again. Because there's this thought in, the ch- in that church, there's a group of people saying, hey, Christ isn't enough. You have Christ now, but we need to go back to following these laws. That's what really makes you a Christian. These empty philosophies, these worshiping angels, these elemental spirits, that's 
is what need, is needed for the gospel. You aren't saved. Or you don't have a deeper Christianity until you believe that. You're not saved. And so Paul is warning these people with a funny pun, a play on words, saying don't go back to the synagogue. Don't be synagogued again. Don't let it take you captive again. You don't need that. You don't need Jewish mysticism, and you don't need to follow empty philosophy. And what probably garnered a huge sigh of relief from the Gentile men, you don't need to be circumcised. Right? He's saying, you d- <laughs> thanks, Millie, you don't need it. And that probably, I mean, people probably rejoiced. I can see him now, this clapping and celebration when they read this letter. That, Thank God we don't need to do that now that we're, we're 40. <laughs> if any teachings or philosophies or mysticisms end up telling you that you need something added to what Christ has done, it is a false teaching. What a great way today to judge teaching. If it doesn't lead to Christ, it's wrong. Uh, I love there's like heresy hunters now they try to find heresy, but if they're preaching Christ, they're right. If it doesn't lead to Christ, if Christ isn't the head of what they're preaching, it's wrong. That's the easiest way to tell, hey, you're leading us away from something. They're saying you need something extra than Christ. That is not correct. Christ is the head of everything. I love this. For the fullness of deity dwells in his body. And so we see with the elemental spirits, there's a Jewish like mysticism that believed like there's these spirits around that had godlike powers. And Paul is saying that's wrong. The only image of God is Christ. That's the only way he was put on the earth. And the fullness of body dwells the godliness, and that was Christ. There are no elemental spirits you need to worship. When I hear elemental spirits, I think of Captain Planet, like earth, wind, fire. <laughs> Captain Planet, you're our hero. Going to take pollution down to zero, that type of thing. But they are actually worshiping spirits of that day, thinking they'd go get them something. Like if you worship rain, if you worship water, something happens. And Paul is saying, that's not of God. Christ is the answer to everything in him. In him, you've been filled in him, who's the head and ruler of all authority. There is no other authority. Christ is the final authority. Anything else doesn't matter. If they, if they lead you down any other path and Christ is not there at the end of it, being the head of all of it, they are wrong. There's a great phrase that popped up in Christianity a few years ago. We did a home group on it, probably one of the second home groups we did on the church uh, and it said, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And that's a statement that we're making today, that Paul's trying to make. There is no need to add anything to what Christ has done. There's no deeper secret Christian life that you're missing out on. Christ is all you need. All you need. There's nothing else. He is the fullness of God in bodily form. He is the true authority, the only authority. I want to reread a few verses here today. Let's start at verse 13. And if you're sitting here today going, I wonder how God views me, if you're always questioning what God views me like, you're watching online saying, how does God look at me? This is it right here. This is one of the clearest gospel messages written down in Colossians 4, starting at verse 13. And you who were once dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all his trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. What a great reminder of who we were and who we are now. Who we were. You're not still that person. You're not still dead in your trespasses and your sin and the uncircumcision of your flesh. You are made alive in Christ. Turn to your neighbor and say, look at me now. That's who you are, alive in Christ, buried and risen with Christ, from death to life, from guilty to forgiven. That's the posture we walk in now. The law condemned us to death. Jesus nailed that law to the cross. It died there. There's no more thing calling you guilty. I love, I'm a big Law and Order fan. Me and my wife are working through all the seasons for some reason. We're on season nine. This is Ice T arresting you. I love Ice T on the Law and Order. Anyone else a big Ice T Law and Order fan? He always catches the guys that they're running. He arrests you, he takes you to court. You got whatever DA you want to look at from all the Law and Orders. And the judge just bangs the hammer and says, "You're, you're not guilty. Even though the case against you is guilt. Even though you've done everything wrong in your life, a judge says, 
you're not guilty. And that's what God is doing today. He's banging his gavel and saying, not guilty. Why? Because of what Christ has done for us. And now we are in Christ, buried and risen and made alive in him. That is good news today. That is the gospel message today. We have a new life. Jesus rose and we rose with him, and now we have a new life. Jesus triumphed. He's overall. And this picture at the very end of the verse, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. That's a very odd thing, because if you look back at Jesus' life and look at the cross, that does not look like triumph of that day. Triumph of that day, uh, if you don't know any, if you, I will explain it to you. They, if they went to war and they conquered a kingdom, they would have a parade back to their city, and at the end of that parade would be the leaders of that old kingdom naked, put to shame, going back to captivity. And so that was the way it was done then. But what we see is Jesus flipped that. He was put to shame on the cross to us, to, God, to our human eyes. He was put to shame, hung naked on a cross. But because of that, because of the way God works, he flipped it. He triumphed because of that. And now the rulers and the authorities that thought they killed the son of God, that thought they, they ended this message of his, were put to shame because he's alive. And not by a victorious triumphal military victory. He's alive because he sacrificed his life for us and buried and rose again, and now we rise with him. That is the good news of the gospel. That is the good news of what he's done for us today. So if you're sitting here saying, what does God view of me? You are guiltless. You are forgiven. He sees Christ. He doesn't see your shame. He doesn't see your past, your present, your future mistakes. He sees Christ. And that is the posture of how we enter in uh, to relationship with him. We don't go in all shameful and sorry. We go in knowing that he sees us as forgiven and sinless. And so that raises a lot of questions, right? If he views us like that, how do we live our lives? And luckily for us, Paul addresses that in the next section of verses. Let's read starting at verse 16. It says, therefore, and I love growing up, Pastor Ruddy would always, every time Pastor Ruddy would read a therefore, he goes, we got to look what it's there for. And so that stuck in my head. Paul is continuing his thought. You were raised with Christ, he triumphed. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you insisting on asceticism or worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by a sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grow with a growth that is from God. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch referring to the things that perish as they are used according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. So the Colossians church had a problem. Instead of celebrating who they were in Christ and the relationship they had with him, a moralistic religion has started to creep in. The church was not a judgment-free zone. The church did not look like Planet Fitness. It looked like Crunch Gym. Sorry, Andy. <laughs> Andy works at Crunch. I had to make that joke. But I love, like, I, go, I used to go to Planet Fitness all the time. On Mondays, they give out free pizza, which is the oddest thing for a gym. But I'm like, this truly is a judgment-free zone. I'm running on the treadmill at a 1, and I go eat five squares of Old Force pizza, and I get back on the treadmill, and no one's looking at me. There's people that used to sit there and just eat pizza the whole night. <laughs> judgment-free. And I know that's a silly example, but that's what the church is supposed to look like, a judgment-free zone. There were a lot of Old Testament laws to be kept. And this group of people in the church decided that they were going to be the ones making sure that they were still being kept. And you weren't a Christian if they weren't being kept. There's a long list of things that you couldn't touch, taste, or handle if you were Jews, Jewish. There is a religious denial of things. And it gets tricky, right? Because I was like, how do I make an example today? And this is a terrible example. I would never follow down this route, but I was like, how do I get people to make 
sure this is a judgment-free zone. I was going to bring a beer up here and just open the beer and start drinking it. That was a terrible example. But I'm like, that is like the do not taste, do not touch laws. They're actually saying that. There's actually churches. I was reading John Piper's thoughts on this verse, and they, they changed their laws on drinking in their church. It used to be a no-drinking church, right? I mean, lots of churches from back then were. And he's like, I can't do that anymore. If you're not an alcoholic and you're not going into sin, you can have a beer. This is a judgment-free zone because of these and that's a crazy example. I've never done that. Jesse would have fired me tomorrow if I opened a beer on the stage and drank it. But that's how serious this was. They were saying, hey, you still can't eat the meats. You still can't do this. You have to do all this. And Paul's saying, no, that doesn't matter. I had an aunt growing up, a great aunt. We would go to her house, and she had no playing cards in her house because she was convinced gambling was a sin. I didn't want to gamble. I want to play go fish. <laughs> Why are there playing cards in this house? And that's how... Crazy moralistic, this line of thinking can get you. Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. They missed the point of the gospel. The law was a shadow and a pointer of Christ. The law wasn't a bad thing inherently. It told people how to live a moral life. Uh, There's a shadow, it pointed to Christ saying, hey, we need Christ because we've tried this law for a thousand years and we keep failing at it. We keep messing up, we keep making mistakes. We, and it pointed to a need for a savior. The law isn't our savior. The law points to a need for a savior. Those celebrations and festivals, they're meant to celebrate a coming savior. But now that savior is here. So what are we celebrating? Why are we still doing those? And we don't do that today, luckily. We're not, we don't celebrate new moons and festivals. But what I'm seeing here is Paul is encouraging us, celebrating Christ. He won the victory. The group back then, they thought they could build some moral ladder up to heaven, right? When we do that today, who's with me? Growing up in church, I thought there were so many good works I had to do to get to God. Until I was about 16 years old, and, I, and Jared Ruddy smacked me on the back of the head with a sermon once about grace. And I'm like, oh, that's what grace is. I was so bound up in shame and failure because all these things I thought I had to follow to get to God I failed every time. Who's with me? We all fail every time. And that points to a need of, of a savior. We, we climb this moralistic ladder to the top rung and we fall off again. And we missed out on the fact that God came down to us. We didn't need a ladder to heaven. We didn't need to somehow build ourselves morally up to heaven. The savior came down to us and showed us his love. I love this, while we are in our trespass, while we are still sinning, God comes down and shows us forgiveness and mercy and love. No qualifications. There's nothing you could have done to make his thoughts any different about you. Christ is the answer to all our problems. Paul even points it out here. He says, talking about the do not touch and do not handle rules. He said, these indeed have an appearance of wisdom, which they do. It's smart to stay away from things. There's some things we all should stay away from. It's smart. But they also promote self-made religion and asceticism. Asceticism is like denying yourself. It's also people used to beat, you ever know, the, pe beat themselves, like whips, think they got closer to God. That's also a form of asceticism. But they are no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Why? Have you ever tried to deny yourself from something? Who's here... Maybe I'm the only one. I've tried to diet. I'm like, I'm going to stay away from cheese and everything. And then the next day, a pizza shows up at work. You can't stay away. It is impossible. Denying yourself only once you make those, it makes you want those things even more. And Paul is saying, you're going to fail every time unless you put your hope in Christ. God came down to them in their guilt and sin and trespasses, and he didn't judge them, he saved them. There's no need to add anything to the gospel. There's no need to do better. In the ESV, uh, they title this little section of verses from 16 on, it says, let no one disqualify you. And I love that. Because a lot of times we walk around feeling disqualified, myself included. I walk around going, well, my, my past mistakes have sort of stopped me from doing more for God. It's not true. You are qualified. The king of kings and the lord of lords, the creator of the cosmos has qualified you. Think of that. The one who is over everything has qualified you. What if we walked 
out like that on the earth today. Instead of being shamed and fearful when we come into church, we live as qualified sons and daughters of the king. He's qualified us today. There's no need to add anything. There's no moralistic thing you need to do to get closer to God. He came down to us. And that's how we're supposed to live our lives today, judgment-free. You don't need to beat yourself up and deny yourself of things to get closer to God. He's already close to you. There's a song uh, just came, this whole CD just came out uh, by Maverick City and Elevation Church. But there's a song on there called Gyra. The opening song is, I've never felt more love than I am right now. And I love that line because it's so true. There's nothing separating you from God's love right now. He's closer to you than your own skin. He's waiting for you. There's nothing you've done that separates you. His love is right there. Do we realize it? Or are we in this mentality of doing things to get his affections, to earn his affections? Growing up, I, I luckily uh, was fortunate enough to have some pretty loving parents uh, that I did things for because I loved them. I, I was never a bad kid. I never, I don't know why. I just never strayed away from doing anything. I ne- but most of that was because the confidence my parents put in me and the trust they put in me because I knew they loved me regardless of what I would do. And I've heard all these stories of the opposite. And sometimes you're raised in strict families and it doesn't happen. But most people I know that were raised in a really strict, like, do this, do this, don't do that. Family all sort of went nuts at one point in their life. I'm just being honest. And somehow, because my parents have shown me love and grace and freedom, they modeled that to me that I, that's how I worked and that's how I lived out my relationship with them. It was, wasn't a, like I have to do something to earn my dad's affection. I knew he loved me and he showed me he's loved me. I understand that's not the way some of you guys are brought up. I don't want to make that seem like the normal. I understand that some family situations are tough, but that is the way we're supposed to approach God. We're not supposed to work to get something from him. We work because we're already approved by him. It makes a difference in how you work. And I love this. Jesus, or Paul mentions like, don't follow the Sabbath. He's not saying don't take rest. But a Sabbath isn't a Sabbath if you're forced to follow it, right? That is no Sabbath. I remember I was at a Bible school down south, and uh, this is a really, maybe this is the baddest I've been. But uh, every Tuesday from like 3 to like the next day, they, they called it a Sabbath day. And we weren't allowed to leave our bedrooms and mind you, at the time, I was living on a property that used to be Jim Baker's, like the, the televangelist Jim Baker's are living on that property in a bunkhouse that had no windows because he built it as a last resort to get people to there because he was losing money and all that stuff. And so I lived in a place with no windows. I'm like, hey, take a Sabbath and stay in your room from four to the next day. And I'm like, what? And so one time, me and my roommate had enough and we snuck to my cousin's house because my cousin lived down there and we... And we were like, we're going to play FIFA. So we're up playing FIFA on this TV in their living room. And all of a sudden, we hear a door downstairs. And we look out the window, and it's the leader of my Bible college coming in to grab something that we had no idea was going to be there. And you know what we did? Because we felt shame and embarrassment because this was forced on us. We went and hid in my cousin's closet in his bedroom. And this is the worst part of the story. My roommate, who's also named Ben always wore these bright orange Crocs. Crocs are back, by the way. Crocs are coming back for some reason. I might have to buy a pair because I like sneakers, and if they're back, I'm buying them. Uh, my wife's staring at me. <laughs> but they're cheap now. They're cheap. But uh, he left those at the front door when we came in. So right away, the leader of my Bible college walks in the door, looks down, and knows at least he is there. So he starts looking for us. <laughs> Because he knows it's Sabbath rest time. And he finds us in a closet. (laughs) How embarrassing is that? I'm 20 20 years old in a closet. (laughs) Hiding. But that is what that does. Paul is saying the Sabbath is good. But it's not a Sabbath if it's forced on you. There's a rest in Christ. That's where your Sabbath is. It's not an observing a certain day. It's putting your rest in Christ. You don't have to work anymore to gain anything with him. Your rest is in Christ. That's how we Sabbath now. It's not a law we have to follow. It's a position of our heart where we say we're going to rest in Christ because everything is in him. We need to go from a, a, I call it the do view of God, where we have to do, 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 all this stuff, and we have to transition to a done view. 
He did it all for us. It is done. It is finished. It was complete on the cross. Let's walk in that freedom today. Let's walk in that grace today. Where anything you've done in your past, your present, if you messed up this past week, he is not looking at you with judging eyes. He's looking at you with loving eyes. And this also affects how we present the gospel to others, right? We are not one of those commercials on TV where there's tons of like fast talking words at the end and they suck you into something, right? That is not the gospel. It's not, hey, you're safe. You got to follow this. You got to do this. 999. That's not the gospel. The gospel has no fine print to it. The gospel message is we were dead in our sins. Christ came while we were still sinners and he saved us regardless of what it looked like. There is no moralistic code that gets us closer to God. He's close right now. There's nothing you can do. I never felt more love than I am right now. That's how God is viewing us today. Worship team, you want to come forward. I want you to hear me out today. Uh, if you heard this message today, and you go home and you say, Pastor Ben said I can do whatever I want. I can live in sin. You miss the point of my message. I lost a close friend this week to a drug overdose, and I wish I had told him this more times to stop doing drugs. Even, like, it's just, it's on my heart right now. I don't know why. But there is stuff you, just, you should avoid. There's stuff you should avoid. I'm not saying go and do whatever you want. Sin. Paul even has to clarify to the Romans when he's preaching grace. He's like, his grace doesn't abound, so we sin more. That's not the point of his grace. Yes, there's nothing that would disqualify you from the love of God. That doesn't mean you now have a free pass to sin. And luckily, Paul just doesn't end this part here. Jesse's going to preach next week on what it actually looks like to be alive in Christ. That since we are made alive in Christ, there's a new certain way of living. We don't, we don't live like the worldly people do. We live like Christ calls us to live. It doesn't mean we get closer to him because of it, but he's calling us because we're made alive in him to live like him. He was a true example. This isn't an obligation to earn any right standing, but it's an obligation to live right out of love and understanding that Christ made us new. And next week, it's going to be a powerful message about how we're raised with Christ, made to put on Christ, put on a new man. And in there, I, don't, I can't spoil just his message. So I'm not going to preach it, preach it anymore. I want to preach it because it goes along with it so bad. My message today is to come up against the religious mindset that wants to add more to what Christ has already done. I want to come up against this insider sort of religion that's, that creeps into the church still today that's saying you have to do more. You have to earn his grace. And God's saying my grace is right here for you. It's done. It's already done. Right now you are loved and chosen and qualified by God, there's nothing more you can do. Nothing. And that changes how we worship. It changes how we live our lives. Because if you come here on Sunday morning, or if you're worshiping at home, and you think, I, I, don't, I, I don't feel it. I'm not good enough for him. That is a false teaching. You are good enough for him right now. That affects how we live our lives. That affects how we rest. We can stop striving to get something from God. He's already given it to us. So I encourage you to say, hey, to live a, a qualified life in him, not in yourself. I love this section of verses have the most in hymns. I think Jesse counted them. I forgot to get the total. I could have counted them, but I didn't have time. I think it says in him like nine times in here. And that's how we live our lives, not in ourselves, not what we can do, not what we can, all this work we have to do, not how many laws we can follow, not how good we were in the week. Our life is in him, what he has done. That's how we view our lives today. If you are qualified, our response today is to live in Christ. So I encourage you as we worship, if you guys want to stand, I encourage you to take this time to recognize, what, one, what Christ has done for you. And then examine your own heart and say, God, are there times where I think I need to earn your grace? Are there times where people are telling me I'm not saved because of things that I have done? And I want you to just take those out of your mind and view yourself as a qualified son and daughter of the Most High King. 
And then I encourage you also as we go throughout our lives and our work week, this is how we present the gospel to others. It's not some rules and list. It's a loving king that came down to us to save us. And that's how we present. That's how we're supposed to go out. So I encourage you uh, today as we finish with this worship song, it's a great song, just to realize who you are in Christ. Put down your thoughts about yourself and think about him. Think on him and put yourself in him. You were buried with him. All your sin, your past, your shame, buried. And now you're alive in Christ, raised back with Christ, alive in him. That is the posture of how we worship today. So I encourage you guys, as we go into worship right now, throw your shame and your guilt and your sin at the feet of Jesus and call yourself worthy because he's calling you worthy right now. And next week, there's going to be more about this and how we live in Christ. But right now, he is closer to you than you can imagine. And he just wants a relationship with you. Not religion, not morals. He wants a relationship with you. You are his son. You are his daughter. And he wants to speak with you today. So let's worship.